we have oh we have richards richard pearson now richards um richard and i go a long way <laughs> uh richard has been uh, uh with uh, with malaria gen uh both at welcome sanger institute and at the university of oxford uh for for several years uh he he's been working uh in Kiyakovsky group previously and now he's at the um the genomic surveillance unit um and uh, he's very much involved uh, in sort of putting together enormously large sets of whole genome sequence data for the uh, for the malaria gen plasmodium falciparum community project. So, without further ado, Richard. Thanks, Richard. Um, I'm going to talk about how whole genome sequencing can help us to defeat malaria. Um, so, Oliver has probably gone through most of this. Um, I'm currently uh, in the parasite surveillance team of uh, a department at the Sanger called the, the Genomic Surveillance Unit, or GSU. Uh, my roles, I, I guess, kind of threefold. Uh, firstly, um, translating raw sequence data into what we call analysis-ready data, so that's essentially um, um, genotypes, um, and then delivering releases of that data to both to malaria gen partners and to, to the wider um, community and then also analysis and interpretation of these data. Um, and I think it's just worth saying that there's a number of sort of different dimensions to the data. So um, we've heard um, a, a bit about targeted amplicon sequencing today, which is certainly one of the things that we're working on, but also I'm, I'm largely involved with whole genome sequence data. And it's perhaps also just worth mentioning that I work both with uh, Plasmodium falciparum and with Plasmodium vivax. And although most of our work to date has been on short read Illumina data, I am very interested, and in, we are very interested in, in longer read data. So I'm working closely with Will Hamilton on also nanopore data, for example, who we've just, uh, just heard. Uh, and uh, when I'm not sequencing parasites, I'm in a group called uh, Wood Street Dogs. Um, but the, the way more important group that I'm part of is, um, is malaria gen. So first and foremost, the Malaria Genomic Epidemiology Network is a, a data sharing network with over 200 partners. Uh, these partners are based in over 40 countries, most of which are a malaria endemic. Um, and since 2021, uh, network coordination has been based out of the, uh, out of the Sanger Institute. Um, and our team there includes staff supporting the malaria gen community, receiving and processing samples, building and running uh, data pipelines and communicating plans. Um, oops, sorry, wrong way. Um, so a key malaria gen output is our public data releases. So here we really combine data um, from all of the samples that have been sequenced to date uh, and run a bioinformatics pipeline to well identify all the genetic differences between uh, those samples. So our first open access release of falciparum data was called PF3K because it uh, contained approximately 3,000 samples. Uh, this was followed by PF6 and the most recent release, uh, PF7, which we've heard, heard a bit about today in various talks, uh, which has over 20,000 samples. Uh, and since releasing PF7, we've been making uh, monthly releases of whole genome sequence data uh, back to malaria gen partners. And we're currently building the PF8 uh, public release, which will contain over 30,000 samples from 35 different countries. Um, now, to date, malaria gen releases have, have included data from samples sequenced at the Sanger uh, Institute. But for PF9 release and going forwards, we intend to aggregate um, all of that data with all of the other uh, data that's publicly available uh, to create a, an even more comprehensive uh, data resource. And the key idea here, um, of course, is, is data sharing. Uh, and I'm sort of very much of the opinion that, that when it comes to data, that you know, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts i.e. the more the community shares uh, data, the better. Um, so why are we doing all this whole genome sequencing? So as I say, we've heard about um, a fair bit about targeted amplicon sequencing today. Uh, and this has um, clearly been extremely valuable, uh, you know, particularly for detecting how levels of, of drug resistance, for example, are changing around the world. And compared to whole genome sequencing, um, amplicon sequencing is you know, it's clearly more economic and, and scalable. Uh, the analysis of amplicon data is much simpler, uh, so less, less need, for example, for high performance computing and high levels of bioinformatics and uh, data science uh, expertise. 
Uh, and if we're only interested in the prevalence of known drug resistance uh, mutations, uh, the analysis is much more direct. So, so if if whole genome sequencing is is much more expensive and, and more difficult, you know, why bother? Uh, and of course, the, the the key reason is that parasites are constantly evolving, um, uh, and there, uh, and hence, you know, new variants of, of interest uh, uh, need need to be discovered. Um, now, they're evolving partly in response to pressures that we're uh, that you know we're inflicting on the parasites, for example, um, you know, the antimalarial drugs that, that people are, are taking. Um, and we don't know in advance how the parasites will in, in evolve to, to counteract these pressures. So, for example, we don't know which genes will be involved. So, as an example, when I joined uh, Malaria Gen 11 years ago, there were no genetic markers for resistance to artemisinin or for resistance to, to piperiquin, uh, but we now have reliable markers uh, for both of these drugs. Um, and it's whole genome sequence data that's you know, that's helped us to discover these markers. Um, so imagine if we created a target to the panel back in uh, you know, back in 2012 and only used that um, to, to analyze uh, data, we basically have missed all of the, you know, the interesting findings from, from the last one. So um, I think it's important to realize you know, that these targeted panels of drug resistance markers uh, you know, do need to be continuously uh, updated, and it's information derived from whole genome sequence, uh, which will uh, which will inform that. But of course, it's not just drug resistance um, that's of interest in malaria control elimination. There's you know increasing evidence, for example, that rapid diagnostic tests um, are failing due to mutations uh, in parasite genomes, and this is due to more complex um, variation involving deletions of large regions of of, of, of chromosomes. Um, but first, let's go back to the problem of drug resistance uh, you know, and how we might be able to, um, to detect this. So um, the first question we'll ask is how whole genome sequence data of malaria parasites can be used to find new genetic uh, markers of drug resistance. So one way we can do this is by essentially taking two sets of samples, one set that are, are resistant to a drug uh, and another set that are, are sensitive to, to that same drug. And with the, we then essentially uh, look for differences in the genomes between these uh, these two groups of samples. So if there's a mutation that's that's seen much more often in the resistant samples uh, than in the in the sensitive samples, that mutation has likely been selected for uh, and is therefore a good candidate as a drug resistance marker. So this type of study is known as the genome-wide association study or, or GWAS. Uh, and this figure is from uh, Olivo's 2015 Nature Genetics paper. Uh, where he studied the genetic architecture of, of artemisinin resistance. So this was a, a, a GUAS from samples from, from the, the Greater Mekong subregion, um, comparing infections that took a long time to clear um, uh, parasites after artemisinin treatment with infections that, that cleared uh, much more rapidly. Uh, so by looking across the uh, the 14 chromosomes uh, of the of the falciparum genome. Uh, we can see the mutations that had the most significant differences in frequency uh, between these uh, between these two groups of samples. But we can see that the most uh, significant um, association was found in the gene uh, Kelch or Kelch 13. Uh, but there were, uh, and that's you know, since it, that's now you know, the key uh, marker for RTBs in existence. But there were also other uh, other signals, for example, in the genes Paradoxin, uh, ARPS10, um, and so on. The, and these are really part of the genetic background, uh, which is allowing artemisinin and uh, resistance uh, to occur. Uh, so, and it's, it's already been mentioned that although you know, Kelch 13 mutations are now starting to emerge in East Africa and are associated with artemisinin and resistance, they're, they're different uh, mutations and, and don't have the same genetic background uh, as parasites in, in Southeast Asia. Um, so, although a powerful method, uh, GUAS does require the availability of, of phenotypes uh, such as parasite clearance of our fly, um, which are you know, much more difficult and, and expensive to obtain than simply uh, you know, taking a dried blood spot from the patient and, and sequencing it. Um, so, an alternative approach to determining possible uh, drug resistance mutations is to mine. Uh, large sets of whole genome data, so-called signatures of selection. So here, advanced methods are used to identify uh, uh, regions of the genome that appear to have been under recent selection. 
uh, you know, without without knowing anything about the phenotypes uh, of the of the underlying samples. So here is an analysis um, done by Offord and Guar and colleagues using the Allergen data um, from the Gambia. Um, similar to the last plot here, the, the x-axis shows the 14 chromosomes uh, of the falciparum genome, and each point represents a, a specific mutation. Um, and there are uh, three clear plot, uh, peaks on, on this plot. So the first peak is, is here on chromosome 4 around the, the gene DHFR, so mutations there are uh, um, associated with the existence of the drug pyrimethamine. Uh, there's a clear peak here on chromosome 7 centered on CRT, uh, mutations of which are associated with the resistance to chloroquine and other drugs. Uh, but the middle peak here is on chromosome 6, and it's centered around uh, a gene um, called AAT1, uh, which, like CRT, has also uh, also has a role um, in, in chloroquine resistance. So by constantly running methods such as this on, on new um, whole genome sequence data as it becomes available, we could potentially create like an early warning system highlighting new mutations uh, that might be indicative of new forms of drug resistance. So this will, however, you know, require dense and, and continued whole genome sequencing sample, uh, uh, sequencing uh, of samples uh, from around the world. So in addition to statistical methods for determining associations uh, with drug resistance, uh, it can also be very useful um, to, to have tools for exploratory data analysis. So here's an example of a tool we've recently created, the working title of which uh, is the Mutation Discovery App. So uh, this allows the user to look at the variation of any of the 5,000 genes uh, of the falciparum genome. So here we're looking uh, at that gene we just mentioned, AAT1. And we're showing the uh, the seven most common variants or, or haplotypes uh, of this gene. So uh, just on this plot, the, the, there's, there's three parts to this plot. So the, the top part uh, shows uh, the the frequency of each of these variants or haplotypes uh, seen around the world, and there's samples with each of those. Um, the, the middle part here shows the distribution of those between the, the 10 populations uh, that, we've, that we've defined. And then the bottom part shows the the actual mutations that are seen uh, within each one of these uh, each one of these variants within each one of these haplotypes. Um, so, as noted in the previous slide, this this gene has recently been associated uh, with chloroquine resistance, uh, and in particular, they showed that the um, the F three one three S mutation. Uh, reduces resistance to chloroquine, but it restores fitness uh, that is lost by, by other mutations, in particular by uh, mutations in the gene uh, CRT. Um, so you, we can see the F313 mutation here, and we can actually see this uh, appears in a number of different variants or haplotypes. So here it appears just by itself, but it also appears with, with other mutations. Um, and I'm going to uh, focus particularly on uh, on this uh, this haplotype or this this variant here, which has the F313S, but additionally uh, a Q454E uh, mutation. Um, and this is particularly interesting because this dark blue bar here shows that we only see uh, this haplotype in the eastern part of the Greater Mekong subregion. Uh, so immediately that, that becomes kind of interesting, and you know, we see it in a lot of samples. Um, so by clicking on this variant in the app, uh, we get a, a second plot, uh, which we call uh, the abacus plot, for hopefully obvious reasons. Um, so the abacus plot shows us the frequency of this particular variant or haplotype at, at different times in, in different places. So the, the x-axis here, I uh, don't know if you can see, but that, that's got the, the year. So they're ordered from earliest to, to most recent uh, samples. Um, uh, and then the, the, the rows or the y-axis are, are the different um, locations. So the shading of each circle here shows the frequency of this variant with darker circles indicating higher frequency. Uh, and the white circles with the crosses are essentially at a frequency of zero, i.e. this this particular variant wasn't seen uh, at all um, in, uh, at, at, this plot, uh, at, at this time in this place. Um, so looking at the applicus plot, it's clear that this variant has been increasing rapidly in frequency, uh, particularly sort of in Cambodia and, and Vietnam. So the, you can see the 
uh, the points getting darker as we move here from from left uh, to right. Um, so I think this 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 variant is really a candidate for for follow up uh, functional work, for example, to do it, to determine its drug resistance profile. But it'll also be interesting to watch the trajectory of this uh, going forwards. So will it, uh, you know, like other mutations, rise to shape fixation, or might it fade away because, for example, it was uh, being selected for previously by a drug that's no longer in use. So here, hopefully, I've given you a, a flavour of uh, how this new tool, uh, you know, enabling rapid exploratory analysis of whole genome uh, sequence data, uh, might reveal new insights uh, into the resistance. Uh, and bear in mind that this gene, uh, AAT1, uh, isn't currently included in, I think, any of the, the amplicon sequencing panels, and therefore it's only from whole genome sequence data uh, that we can see uh, these patterns. Um, so in the last few slides, we've really been focused on the first bullet point here, discovery uh, of new variants of interest. However, in the next uh, example, I'll, I'll show you how patterns of complex variation uh, can inform transmission dynamics. Um, so, yeah, so there are increasing reports of, of failures uh, of rapid diagnostic tests used to identify malaria, and whole genome sequence can be uh, invaluable here. So the most commonly used diagnostic test uh, for cyprin malaria detects the presence of the HRP2 protein, but also uh, cross-reacts with, with HRP3. However, parasites can survive without either of these proteins. So parasites that have deleted the genes uh, coding them are, are effectively invisible um, to these tests. Uh, now, there are a number of molecular assays, such as PCR, that can be used to detect the presence or absence of these genes. But with whole genome sequence uh, data, it gives us an, an extra dimension of insight, you know, allowing us to also understand the actual nature of the of the deletions, i.e., exactly which sections of the genome ha have been deleted. And knowing this information allows us to identify uh, different types of deletion, which in turn can help us understand uh, how these deletions are spreading. Um, so this figure is from the most recent Malariagen paper. If we concentrate first on the top part of the figure. Uh, the line at the top is, uh, sorry, excuse me. Oh. Uh, the line at the top uh, represents the whole of uh, the sequence of chromosome 8, and then below it, we're expanding on the, the, a small section of the right-hand end of this, uh, which includes the gene HRP2, shown here in red. And then the five lines above this are essentially showing us that there are five different types of mutation uh, of this gene. Uh, and if we look, you might not be able to read, but each one of these is only seen uh, in, in a specific country. And then uh, at the bottom, we're looking at, at chromosome 13. Uh, here, over on the right, we have the gene HLP3. Here, we can see that there are many different types of deletion. And again, most of these are only seen in one country. But if we look at this particular deletion here, we see that this has been seen both in Cambodia, but also in Laos. And then there's also uh, a different uh, deletion here, which is seen uh, in Cambodia, but also in, in, in Vietnam. Um, so this you know, suggests that parasites containing these, uh, you know, these specific deletions might actually have, have spread across borders. So this is really sort of getting into the understanding the local uh, versus imported um, uh, transmission. Um, so if I've uh, just got a, a few minutes left, I finally thought I'd just say a few words about what, what the future might hold. So perhaps the most worrying question is whether parasites might evolve to become resistant to all frontline drugs, uh, in which case malaria um, could become untreatable. Uh, thankfully, there are, there are some things in our favour. For example, there appear to be uh, opposing selective pressures from, uh, from different drugs. Um, and because of uh, there are these opposing pressures. There are various suggestions have been have been made to mitigate the risks of drug resistance. For example, you know, rotating between different drug combinations or using triple combination therapies. However, I mean, I think history does really teach us that eventually parasites will continue, um, you know, to find ways to to resist essentially anything that that's thrown thrown at them. Uh, and I think it's highly likely that new new mutations will emerge in parts of the genome where we're least expecting. I mean, I think that was certainly there. I don't think anyone was expecting Couch 13. I don't think uh, anyone was really expecting plasmepsin uh, duplications. Uh, but they they both turned out to be important for um, drug resistance. Um, so, and it was mentioned. I mean, I think actually for me, 
um, perhaps the more worrying, um, more worrying even than the rise of couch 13 mutations in East Africa, uh, comparing resistance to artemisinin has been seen recently, is actually, I, I think there, there is um, increasing evidence that the key partner drug, lumafunching, uh, is becoming less uh, effective. So there were some talks recently at the ASTMH conference showing that IC50s for lumafunching are, are slowly creeping up and that there are some uh, some reports of treatment failures in, in uh, parts of, of, of Eastern Africa. Um, and, you know, this is the key partner drug used in Africa. So failure, you know, really would be devastating, particularly you know, as drug resistance has, uh, you know, has previously um, been seen in, in the possible alternatives. Uh, and then another huge change in selective pressures in Africa over coming years will, will be the massive rollout of the vaccines, RTSS and R21. Uh, and at this stage, you know, we really don't know how parasites will respond to this. For example, you know, will they become resistant to, to these vaccines? And if they do, uh, well, I mean, the most likely candidate for mutations uh, is the, the gene CSP, which is the gene that's been targeted by, by both of these vaccines. But it's also possible mutations you know, elsewhere in the, in the parasite genome uh, could give these parasites an, an advantage uh, in vaccinated um, individuals. And of course, it's only with whole genome sequence data uh, that we'll know this for sure. Um, finally, although much of the current focus is right on falciparum, I think it's, it's widely accepted that other species causing malaria in humans will, will be harder to eradicate. So, you know, what changes in these genomes uh, will allow them to survive? Well, it's, of course, only that whole genome sequence analysis uh, that allows them to understand this. So, sorry, I think I'm out of time. I'd just like to say uh, thank you in particular to the funders, uh, Bill and Melinda Gates at Foundation, and welcome. Uh, and of course, to all of the Larry uh, Jane points. So, yeah, thank you, Peter. Thank you, Richard, for again that very comprehensive uh, uh, talk. Uh, thank you. For, thank you for the nice presentation. Do you have a suggestion, recommendation of how many samples could be sufficient for? Uh, association studies? I mean, for example, the phenotype with the uh, future uh, markers? Well, I mean, Oliver, how many samples were used in your GRAS study? I mean, it wasn't a huge amount, right? Yeah, a few thousands. A thousand. Yeah, a thousand. I mean, a few hundreds. And uh, in essence, you, as, as you, I mean, probably not telling you anything new, but uh, the problem is that your significance has to increase your level of significance has to increase the more variants that you're testing independently and so if you are testing 30,000 SNPs or 10,000 SNPs then you you need to have a p value of like 10 to the minus 7 so you're going to need hundreds of samples to go that that's bottom line and I, I would say if you have a genome wide um sort of fishing for anything type of GWAS, then uh several hundreds if not a thousand is about what you need but of course it, it depends on the effect size as well so there's a very large effect size uh, by the way that particular uh analysis uh was mostly conducted using uh, samples from the track study and uh, Liz here was the principal investigator, and in fact, the sample size was around a thousand. Uh, we, we had some additional samples, but that's what we were looking for. Just to make a comment, I mean, we're funding a lot of Amplicon sequencing work in LMICs, but what we're also asking investigators to do is to submit 500,000 samples from their country for whole genome sequencing, um, just to make sure that we uh, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater, as it were. So, Yes, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm very, very pleased to hear that. I, I, I do believe that we need to continue to build up this whole genome sequence resources, uh, and not just for doing GWASs, but I think, um, I think we're going to see more and more over the next few years discoveries, uh, just because we got the resolution to do that. Yeah, I think it's worth bearing in mind that you know the costs of CPC are still continuing to drop. So yeah. It is becoming more difficult to do whole genome sequencing. Yeah, it, the uh, the gap between whole genome sequencing cost and amplicon sequencing is 
actually reducing, um, you know, daily uh, event. Thank you so much, Professor Richard Pearson. Very nice presentation. Uh, correctly, if I have wrong understand, um, uh, I saw you so that the mutation F three one three S contribute to reduce the uh, drug resistance. Yeah. But normally, we interested in the mutation with the drug resistance. But here, how you find that one? Because it's, if I understand, it's uh, really with a drug resistance. How you find that? And why we need to interest it in that mutation? So, I mean, I, I'd refer you in particular to the paper by Alfred and Gua and colleagues. So, there was actually a number of different methods that were looked at to, you know, to show that, yes, indeed, uh, yeah, that that mutation did decrease the levels of resistance, but were, were, enabling the parasites to become fitter so you know, this was you know experiments in the lab with with lab strains and you know introducing mutations into to lab strains and, and, and so on yeah. i've referred you to that that, that, paper, that recent paper in science with the map. i think the thing to remember here is that what the mutations that make you resistant to drugs are not always i are, are often quite bad for the parasite, except for avoiding that drug. And so very often they develop other mutations that compensate for this disadvantage. So I think this is more or less the context you have to think of. So in fact, I mean, there was, there was a very nice figure from, from that paper that I just mentioned, showing that with the rise of K76T in CRT, this mutation in AAT1 essentially tracked that. Uh, so as as uh, K760 was increasing, so was this mutation in AAT1. But I think what's now happening is that that mutation in AAT1 is staying there, even though K760 is now dropping in lots of places. Thanks, Richard. Lovely presentation. Um, it's probably an obvious question coming from me, but um, I was just wondering what, what are the plans for future buybacks or even other species releases? I mean, I think the future, well, certainly what we'd like to do is to continue to, to do, um, I think, particularly whole genome sequencing, because it's it's really only with whole genome sequencing, for example, that I think we're going to be able to find um, markers for resistance to chloroquine in particular, but also for other drugs. Um, so, yeah, and the, yeah, if we can get the funding, then the best we continue to, to sequence biobacks to the whole genome, make the data available to so. Uh, Richard, I have one quick final question for you. Um, I mean, as we move forward, assuming that, uh, you know, everyone in this room is going to get their little nanopore sequencing sequencer and we're all going to produce this uh, whole genome sequences and all this, um, how are people going to be able to assemble and and look at the variance in all this. I mean, it seems to me that, you know, we we can we can do the sequencing, but then to have the informatics that can uh, make your data com comparable to the other samples may be more challenging for people in the low and medium uh, countries. Can you comment on that? Yeah. I, well, I guess. Um... I mean, for me, what, what's happened with malaria gen is that you know, there has been a central repository where all of the data has been brought together. And I think it's important that it's all run essentially through the same uh, through the same pipeline. Uh, so I think, you know, I, I see that continuing to, to happen going forwards. Now, yes, it might be good to, to actually move those pipelines, for example, onto cloud infrastructure uh, as, as we scale up to make things, um, you know, make things essentially scalable to whatever numbers of, of samples uh, we might want to, to make that data available to the Yeah, so I think in the future, sort of having um, collaborations that allow uh, people out in the countries who have uh, so limited resources to be able to feed in. So they upload data, data and then, you know, when the data gets processed. Fantastic. Good, thank you very much.